from uh, Cologne. David, please come to the stage. The floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful meeting and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm David, a PhD student in Björn Schumacher's lab, who you just heard talking a few talks ago. And today I would like to talk about our most recent uh, preprint, namely about accurate aging clocks based on accumulating stochastic variation. In case you have seen the preprint, I will also show some unpublished data, so stay tuned for that. But to start off with aging, you know that every one of us ages, and this can really happen at different speeds. Some of us just age slower or faster than others, and it would be really valuable if we could somehow measure this difference in the biological aging or also this pace of aging. And to this end, and we have already hit this several times in this conference, aging clocks have been devised roughly 10 years ago, and here we usually start off with some biological data, most often DNA methylation data, which then after some pre-processing is fit into a machine learning model that then highly accurately can predict the um, chronological and also subsequently biological age. And um, uh, a few years ago, we have set out and built our own transcriptomic aging clock in which we, for the first time, not only could accurately predict the chronological but also biological age of an organism to a really high accuracy, in this case, the nematode C. elegans. And within the genes that are important for this clock, we found several systemic pathways to be highly enriched. So we find, for example, signal peptides, innate immune response, or neuropeptides. And this really sparks a question on whether aging is programmed. The bit age clock finds the systemic pathways. Epigenetic clocks, on the other hand, also find often enrichments for, for example, developmental, uh, de uh, developmental sites. So it is a sign for a program. This is also something that is recently um, discussed. So, for example, uh, people arguing that the epigenetic clock might control aging or that the modulation of the epigenetic clock uh, sites might be geoprotective. Or Pedro, also recently Stephen Horvath, uh, arguing that aging might be a consequence of the developmental process. On the other hand, we of course know that there's a large entropy-driven part of aging. There are many studies showing an increased variation of noise in the aging process, or that a stochastic process might underlying it. There are many um, uh, chronological aging clocks that can be found throughout the epigenome. We know of this increased cell-to-cell -cell variation or the undeniable role of stochastic DNA damage in the aging process. And then also this recent fantastic preprint by the Gladyshev lab where they show that most DNA methylation sites might actually behave stochastically during aging. And how does this now fit together and how much could actually a stochastic process alone explain? And to try to answer this, we set out and did some simple simulations and I want to briefly walk you through this. So in here we start off without any biological data, so this is now completely artificial just to see whether it works at all and also whether it could be applicable to any data type. We start here with some ground state. This can in this case just be values between 0 and 1, and then we add stochastic variation to this. Stochastic variation here is really just small random numbers that we draw from a normal distribution. And doing this once independently for every single value in the ground state, so the starting point, we define to be one time step and we add 1 to the simulated age. And this then we can, of course, do several times, for example, 1 to 100, and H100, of course, being much more noisy than H1. In total, then, we can do this, for example, six times. Three we can use for training of an elastic net regression model that tries to um, predict the simulated age, so how often we apply stochastic variation, and the rest is then used for independent validation. And in the beginning, we saw exactly nothing. There's a complete flat line. There's no prediction possible at all. And maybe that's also not too surprising because if we just add and add more stochastic variation without any limits, there's no pattern in the data. But this is also not really how biological data behaves. In biology, we usually have some kind of constraints. DNA methylation, for example, is really limited between 0 and 100% in bulk. You cannot go beyond these limits. And just, just by constraining our data to be within some predefined limits, we suddenly see that we can build a predictor that highly accurately can predict the simulated age. Now we wanted to see whether we can do the same with DNA methylation. And for this, we slightly changed our setup and did some single cell simulations. Here again, we have a ground state that is the same for every uh, simulation here. This could be, for example, a young DNA methylation bulk sample from a human. 0 0.13 here meaning that 13% of your cells at this 
uh, CPG site is methylated and there's unmethylated. With this, we can then generate single cells. So for example, if we generate a thousand cells in the first column, for example, 130 would be one, the rest zero. And now every single CPG site has a specific maintenance efficiency rate or also de novo methylation efficiency. How we derive this is not really important, but this gives us a probability with which every single CPG site is stable or also introduces a change or error. So we can basically flip a coin with these probabilities and thereby introduce stochastic variation to the system again. And doing this once for every single CPG site and every single cell, and then afterwards averaging it back, uh, back again to get a bulk sample, we again define to be one time step and everything else is the same as previously. And first of all, we recapitulated our previous results seeing that also with this setup, we can actually build a predictor that is able to uh, predict the simulated age of independent samples. And now this made us wonder because the starting point is biological and everything else is just stochastic variation that we add to it. How now would age predictors behave on this data? And so our surprise, we see a significant, almost linear positive correlation between the simulated age here on the x-axis, so how often we apply stochastic variation to the biological starting point, and in this case, Stephen Horler's uh, original clock um, predictions on the y-axis. And we see essentially the same for all other clocks he tests, so rim age, pheno age, or also whiteness clock, which just consists of three CVG sites. And having seen this, we wondered, can we do even the reverse? So can we use this uh, stochastic data, starting from a biological time point, and build a predictor that then is able to predict the chronological age of samples? And to our surprise, this actually works. So here now on the x-axis is the chronological age of um, novel uh, DNA methylation blood samples. Now the y-axis is now the predicted age based on our stochastic data clock. So this is not chronological age. What about biological age? Is this, is this measurable as well? And for this, we had to look at this recent fantastic publication by Steve Horvath and uh, colleagues, where they built a pan-mammalian clock, which really is able to predict the uh, relative lifespan of a variety of mammals, which of course have a variety of um, maximum lifespans. And here I just want to show you one figure of this plot, uh, of this uh, paper, where they show you all the different mammals here in the circle, sorted by maximum lifespan. And here in this uh, lines on top, they show you the correlation value between the predicted and the um, actual relative age. So how now would a stochastic database clock look on the same variety of data here? And here again, we see that we have a huge overlap. So on average, we see a significant correlation of 0.85 really showing that even this variety of data is predictable just with a stochastic data clock. In the paper then, they went on and tested several biological interventions. And now just focusing on those where we actually had metadata information available and where we could also verify the information. So for example, the growth hormone receptor knockout mice, a TET3 mutant or color restricted mice, here in red indicating uh, that these uh, mice are predicted to be biologically younger, so have a longer lifespan, which matches um, the experiments in wet lab. How now would the stochastic database clock look on this? And again, we see essentially the same. So here um, I show you four different clocks. I don't want to go into detail. These just differ technically slightly and also on how much um, stochastic variation we had. But essentially, in almost all cases, we see a significant um, younger stochastic age exactly the same as the Pomimillion clock shows or also that we know from biology. We then also tested a human uh, smoking data set here on the right, and there we see the opposite. So these actually age faster and have a stronger or a higher uh, predicted stochastic age. And I want to just stress out again, these clocks just consist of one biological starting point and everything else is just pure stochastic variation. We don't need anything else. And then to uh, strengthen our point, we had a look at a reprogramming uh, probing, uh, data set. And they are maybe not surprising anymore, we ex see exactly what we would expect. So after around 10 days of reprogramming, we see a sharp decline in the predicted stochastic data age, exactly with what we would actually expect. So this was all the DNA methylation data. What about other data sets? Is this also possible? What about transcriptomic data, for example? And here we had first a look at our own bit age prediction again. And here, just to remind you, in bit age, we use this term called binarization, where we try to reduce the amount of variance and noise in the data to enable highly accurate predictions by just retaining whether a gene is highly or lowly expressed. So basically just one or zero within each sample. So it's supposed to get rid of noise and it's not supposed to um, correlate with noise, uh, essentially. But to our surprise, even bit age significantly correlates with the amount of stochastic variation that we 
add to a st um, uh, starting point, in this case a C8 against or an AC sample. And naturally here we also wanted to see uh, the opposite, so can we now use this data, so a uh, young RNA seq sample from a C elegance, adds the host variation, build a clock on it, and then predict completely independent uh, RNA seq samples from C elegance. And indeed, also here, we see a significant correlation between the biological age and days of C elegance on the x axis and the predicted age of the stochastic data clock on the y axis, really showing that even in transcriptomic data, we can see the same. So, with this, I hope it could convince you that stochastic variation is actually sufficient to enable reproducible and robust predictors as long as we keep the values within biological meaningful limits that current aging clocks, at least those that we tested, really correlate significantly and just seem to track how much noise accumulated in the data. And we can even do the reverse. So we can build a clock just with simulated data, starting from a biological uh, um, sample, with the emulation, emulation or transcriptomic data, and even predict biological samples in here, chronological as well as biological age. And just to stress this out again, we just need one biological sample, everything else is stochastic variation. So if you're interested in this, uh, please have a look at the recent preprint. As I mentioned, uh, we don't have um, all the data available here yet. So for example, the Palmer-Malian clock um, data is not here yet. But with this, I would like to thank, first of all, Bjorn for having me in this lab and giving me the opportunity to work on this. My uh, lab members here and the, um, my grad school, as well, of course, uh, you for listening, and I would be happy to take any questions. We have time for one quick question. Maybe I will ask, ask it. It, look, it appears that the clock sort of uh, becomes maybe less and less accurate the older. Mm -hmm. So could that indicate that there's maybe two processes, that there's more stochasticity and then, or extra stochasticity in the end? So what we think is happening there is that at some point uh, you reach equilibrium. So at some point you are just so stochastic, so noisy that if you add more, it basically cannot distinguish it anymore. So if you are at that point, then you basically level off. So if you would increase more and more stochastic variation, you would end up at a flat line. So it wouldn't increase even further. So is that the theoretical limit of human aging? <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Thank you so much.